Um, uh, I mean, there's, there's just so much to be said. Uh, we're excited for this. Uh, so you guys know um, all these brothers here that we have, they, they've served here an incredibly long time. And uh, again, time serving a long time is not the only requirement, but it just means that they're tested uh, and they're tried. And um, coming out of um, the early parts of the pandemic when we were trying to gather again, so right around uh, the, the late spring time frame, I passed the mat and I spoke. We actually been speaking about this for some time, and we had kind of identified these guys as as deacons. Deacons are servants, and pass them out. We'll go through that. Um, but uh, we just saw God moving in their lives, and we were very excited to do this. Um, I think we've put them through the ringer. Uh, might might do a little bit more tonight. I don't know. Maybe we should tar and feather you just to just to make sure you want. To. No, but but honestly, it's. Uh, the call to, to serving uh, publicly is, is, is to be an under rower. It's, it's the guy in the ship that's, that's just rowing and rowing and rowing and rowing. Um, and it's hard. It gets taxing, but uh, we know that God's called them to it. Uh, we love them for that, that they're obedient to that. They, they want to do wonderful things for the Lord. Um, if we can have a little bit of pride, we really don't have pride in ministry, but I'm very proud of the, the men that we have here uh, before you. And uh, we're going to keep praying that that. They lead their families first, that they uh, come out here and their leaders here, and they try their best, again, to be honorable, godly men uh, as best as they can in whatever God's called them to. So we are excited for that. All right, let me pray. This is what we do. I'm going to pray, and then each of them are going to come on up and, and give a short testimony, and then uh, Pastor Matt's going to preach a charge, uh, and then thereafter we will lay hands and um, make them deacons as God has called them out to be. Uh, so we're excited about that. So let's bow our hearts and let's pray. And we'll get started. Father, we do thank you, Lord, and I do pray for for David and David and Anthony and Eddie and um, just wonderful things that you've done in their lives, Lord. Uh, I thank you that, uh, first of all, they know you, um, that at the end of their days, Lord, they know exactly where they're going. And I pray for that, for anybody here right now, that if, if they don't know that, Lord, if they don't know that you are the only way to heaven, if you are, if they don't know that you are the truth, Lord, that they would come to that tonight, Lord, through the testimonies, through the teaching, Lord, that that would be evidently clear, Lord. And I, I pray and um, for the things ahead for them, Lord. I thank for the things they've done. But as they press forward, Lord, in ministry, in formal ministry, God, that uh, you would bless them and guide them, Lord, be with their families. And may this walk of theirs with you be even sweeter because of their commitment to you, Lord. We love you. Bless us all here tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, we're gonna have, we're gonna have Eddie Curry come on up first. Eddie, go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, if you guys don't already know, my name's Eddie Curry. I've been coming to this church, I'd say, faithfully for about a little over five years. And you know, it wasn't always that way. I didn't always come to church. My testimony is this: that uh, at a young age. My faithful grandmother, whenever she could find me in the house, when I wasn't faking sick or clinging to my bed, she would take me to church all the time. And I was saved probably at the age of six, you know. At that point, the man who brought me to the Lord had given me his Bible. I still have that Bible today, thank God. And, uh, you know, I was saved at the age of six, but I didn't walk like I was saved until recently. Um, I'll just say that I lived a life that was completely of the world, and I lived a life that was not edifying to God at all. It wasn't until recently that I'm so grateful that I, I can serve at a church, that I can have an appreciation for his word, for his people, and just everything that he's done for me in my life. Um, you hear it so many times. Uh, we have an epidemic going on, you know. It's an opiate epidemic, and it kind of gets pushed to the wayside right now with this whole COVID thing, but... Uh, you know, it's a real issue. It's something that I got caught up in myself. I was a struggling addict, you know what I mean? And it was almost bad because I could keep a job. I could do everything I could do. I could keep my feet and still be a heroin addict and do whatever I wanted to do. And it wasn't until one day when God knocked me down and uh, put me on my back, he, I overdosed. And it was probably the scariest day of my life. But at the same time, it was the biggest blessing in my life because... On that day, I woke up with true fear of the Lord. And we know that fear of the Lord is the beginning of all knowledge and understanding. Yeah. And I knew that he had been with me up until that point. And he says, you want to go this way? 
this is what's going to happen to you, you know? And it wasn't until that point I had a true appreciation for the word of God, for what he's actually done in my life, for how he's been with me through all the times when I thought I was alone. And that goes for each and every one of us in here. And a special brother in the Lord who's up in Maine now, starting his church, Pastor Jonah, always hit home about the training center. He said, man, you need to get your life straightened out. You need to come to the training center. Come to the training center. It wasn't until that day I went into the training center. That's the beginning process of God entering into my life and changing my life. He changed me for the better, and I'm so appreciative of everything he's done in my life. I, I thank you for the, the men he's allowed me to serve with, the church he's allowed me to serve at, the people who's poured into my life. And I'm just grateful that I can do the same to you guys. And God's been such a blessing in my life that all I want to do now is just be a blessing in other people's lives, you know. And I think that's exactly what being a Christian is all about. Is you've received the blessing. We've all received the blessing from the Lord. And now it's our chance, it's our privilege to go out and be a blessing to the Lord. Amen? Amen. Thank you. Amen. 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 All right, next up we got Davey B. Come on up, Dave. All right, tough to follow that one. How's everybody? Good. Amen. Amen. Um, so my wife said, hey, honey, you should dress up. So I broke into Pastor Igor's house on the way over here. And I think I did okay. Uh, God is good. Um, I'm shocked I'm on this stage right now. Uh, where to start? I had a bunch of stuff written down and prayed about it and things like that. Um, once upon a time, <laughs> about 22 years ago, I had made a complete train wreck out of my life. Don't need to go into the gory details, but um, I remember crying out to the Lord, and he saved me. He heard my cry, like in Psalm 40, and he pulled me up, put me on solid ground. Planted me, literally, in a, uh, a Baptist church, and I uh, just... Felt the calling almost right away, just to, what can I do, what can I do, what can I do more, do more, more. So I get involved, getting some, uh, you know, helping out with ministries and things like that, things like that. But then, um, not that I got stale, but I think God said he called me. So one day, one evening, on a Wednesday evening, um, I went to visit some friends at Calvary Chapel North Shore. Anyone remember that? <laughs> on Bourbon Street, a little strip mall. And I sat in the back with, a, with uh, friends of mine. Um, very, very close people I know. Um, and I listened to the service, and I remember after um, just just sobbing in the back. And I don't think anyone knows this. And I couldn't even move. Mm. And I was just, it just, I, and, and I just was Pastor Matt, obviously, and just God has used him so mightily. So I'll speed this up a little. I never left. Uh, you know what? I was kind of in, do, doing some stuff at ministry at um, the Baptist church I was at, and I sat down with that pastor, and I said, look, God's calling me here, and I truly thought he was. So I went on, and started to, you know, started to grow. We got the, the, uh, the old new building, and we get into that, and uh, fast forward again. Um, started to do things in you know, ministry, and just um, felt God's calling on me, calling on my life, calling on my life. And here's what gets a little tricky. Um, I moved away. Ended up moving away up north, and kind of bounced around a little bit, because I, I, I thought I had things all figured out. You know, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And I, you know, get involved with um, some, some plant ch church planting networks, did some of that, did some ministry, um, by uh, church plants, Bible studies, things like that. And um, one day again, it was, it was funny because it was almost that same small, still voice. Come back, come back. Mm. And, cert you know, events that I don't have time to get into. Years ago, God blessed me bringing Christine back into my life. Uh, just amazing. That's a whole other testimony. I'll, I'll move it along here. I'm tearing up. Uh, <laughs> um so he came back, and God said, I need you, this is where you need to be, you need to humble yourself and just be under just godly men and godly sound biblical teaching. I wasn't wacky doodles out there theologically when I was away, but I just, you know, I, I, I was trying to do things my way. I knew I had some type of calling, but, it, you know, I wanted to make sure it was of God. So I sat and just was, and humbled myself, and said, what do you want me to do, Lord? What do you want me to do? You know, I want, just go, go, go. That's how I kind of was with ministry and stuff. And God spoke to me clearly one day. He's like, just, um, he goes, get out of your way. He said, give it all to me hmm. and just just love my people. Clear as day. And God doesn't speak to me all the time. I'm one of those guys who needs like the flashing neon signs and stuff, you know, figure out what to, to do with my life and guidance and things. And he's like, just love my people. Everybody who comes to that door, just love on them and um, just minister to them. And I'll take care of everything else. Don't worry about it. 
So I did that, and lo and behold, the doors just started opening it up, and I wasn't looking or searching for anything, position or whatnot, but um, God just, just started using me because I was trying to be obedient. I was being obedient, and I had learned from the past not to do things my way and not to lean on my own understanding. You know, and I kept getting asked to do more and more, and I'm still shocked at some of the stuff these guys let me do. I really am. It's just knucklehead up here. But um, <laughs> anyway, um, I just, um, when I'm here in this church and I walk in, I just, um, I just feel God's presence all the time here. And I feel his spirit like nowhere I've been. And I, like I said, when I moved away, I bounced around a bit, and I was involved with other things, but just never so pure. You know, the love of God here. Um, I see God working here tremendously. I see the love of God. I see changed lives. I see weddings. Um, I've prayed with a lot of you. Um, I've gotten to, to, to laugh with you guys and get to know you better. I've gotten to know to cry with you. And just, um, it's too humbling. So whatever God has for me, I just want to be open to that. And um, uh, Matthew 24, and I'll close with this. Um, I know my salvation is saved, and I'm saved, and I'm going to heaven. I understand that. But this is one verse that really terrifies me. And it's, Lord, Lord, I'm paraphrasing, and I mess this up, but, um, you know, didn't we do this in your name? Didn't we heal these people? Didn't I do all this stuff in your name? And the Lord's like, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Hmm. I never knew you. And there was a part in my time, and I think I'm humbled and beyond that now, and God removed some dross from me when he brought me back, that it's not about me, and it's about serving and loving others. And at that, that, that verse, if I get to heaven... I will get to heaven. I know that, but I just that still frightens me. And I um, just want to leave it at that. I love you guys very much, and I'm just I I don't deserve to be up here, and it's just just true blessing. And anything we can do, we love you. Amen. Amen. All right. Next up, we've got uh, Mr. Anthony Roberto. Yeah. Well, thank you. And uh, before we start, I want to give God all the glory and praise Him for tonight to be with these men and. And up here, and um, when I looked up the word deacon, it, it reads uh, to serve and uh, to serve a church. And probably about three quarters of my life, I was serving the world. Hmm. And um, <laughs> Satan tried to um, get Jesus Christ to serve the world and bent and bow down to Him. And he didn't fall for it, but unfortunately I did. And following the world is just like that. You have, he lies, Satan. I had so many things in my hands of good things that the world would say, going on trips and uh, always having, when I was young, I was always wanted the best of the best, and I always got it because I worked hard, and working hard was good. But guess what? That's another lie. I was hearing the pastor one time say, you know, being busy, because we're all busy, right? That's what we're doing. But he says busy stands for bought under Satan's yoke. Mm. And that really hit me. And it's so true because my life for money and greed and lust was number one. And God was down here, somewhere down here. I didn't even know where someone was there. But the, the lust and the greed for money was making me happy, and I had joy in that. And that was a false joy. I was, as time was going on, I was so empty and dead inside. But on the outside, like the world would say, I looked like a million bucks. But inside, I was dead and empty and lost. And at that time, <laughs> that's why God is amazing. He puts people in our lives. He has a plan for all of us. We just have to be patient for it. Um, but my, my world, I wasn't. I was just doing my thing. And, um, you know, I got married. I had a child. Her name is Gianna. I love her so much. But unfortunately, that didn't last that long. And I got divorced because I didn't have God in my life. I truly didn't. Mm -hmm. And I thought I would never get married again. And 10 years later, I'm working out at the gym, once again, doing things for myself. 
Not that it's wrong to exercise, don't get me wrong, but for me it was, because it was always about me to look the best. And um, my friend matched me up with this woman. He says, come on, come on, you got to see her. I, it was a blind date. I said, I don't do blind dates, please. So we did agree, and we met. And we, we met at that time, and lo and behold, it, it, it was amazing. And when I did leave that first date, I, I, I knew I loved her. It was amazing, I know. But she didn't, but I did. <laughs> but um, when we first started going out, she wanted to know if I was a Christian, and I was a Christian. I thought I was a Christian, because I went to a Catholic uh, uh, church, and I went to a Catholic school, but I didn't know anything, and that I didn't fear anything. And all the commandments I broke, and I didn't even know I broke them, because I didn't fear God. So when I met her, she says, well, if we're going to continue on dating, uh, you're going to have to come to my church. So I went to the church, like Dave said, up in um, uh, Bonkers there, and I went there. <laughs> and I he, says... You're not referring to Pastor Matt as bonkers. No, 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 no. That's usually and, what I call yeah. him, but... Uh. And I, I says, okay, you know, I, I love this girl. I'm, I want to be with her. So things started getting nice, and we, we started dating for uh, almost a couple of months. And after two months, I proposed to her. And, uh, mm -hmm. and that's when she says, well, you're going to have to meet my father, and you have to meet my pastor. And I says, that, that's all right. I wasn't afraid of the past. I was more afraid of the father coming from the Italian. So we went down to uh, Pastor Matt's office. And we're there. And he says, uh, OK, Anthony, why do you want to marry her? And I says, Pastor Matt, I love her. And he says, why do you want to marry her? And I says, I love her. And he said it again. And I says, what's he, what, who is this guy? <laughs> it, 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 so he says, you know, you can love her, but that's not going to last. And he says, you have to have God first in your life. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be married 11 years this March. And I still remember this. He says, it's like a triangle. You have God up on top. And you're on the left. She's on, she's on the right. And together, as you're walking through in life, you have to walk closer and closer to the Father. Look at him first. And as you do that, you'll become closer and closer together. At that time, I, I says, you know, who's he? <laughs> but later on, as we're getting closer to being married, I'm coming to, his, uh, coming to the church and I'm hearing it, and little by little, God is chasing me down, mm. and he truly is, and he's opening up my heart, opening up my eyes, opening up my ears, and it's just amazing. Things that I used to sing and say, they were just it. Like I played sports, we would say the Our Father, we would say, -ra 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 -ra. I mean nothing. But when I read and say the Our Father today, those words mean so much to me. Amazing grace. I was blind, and now I can see. I truly can. Mm -hmm. I was lost. I truly was lost. And now I'm found, because they found me. And my wife doesn't know this, but she is my apostle, Andrew. She brought me to Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And that is so much that there's no money in the world that can buy that. And the people that were in my life, like Pastor Matt and my cousin Gino, who edified me in God's word and keep teaching me and keep showing me. And this man here, I remember him walking down that hill down on um, our old church, asking me if, uh, do you want to go on a mission trip? I says, I've only been to Aruba and Hawaii and everything like that. <laughs> and he says, no, we're going to go to Peru for 16 days. And that's what we did. Amen. And it started on uh, going to Peru and seeing how other people live. And they had nothing, nothing. 
but they had Jesus Christ and they had so much joy in their lives and their hearts and their souls. And you can see the people who are just out there for the money, they were angry and bitter. Yeah. And I can see that now. And it's, it's, it's just so amazing. And I know I can continue on. I'm, I'm sorry. But, uh, and that's why when Pastor Matt preaches, I always feel like he's talking to me. It's always, oh, oh yeah, it's another one to me. But it's the word of Jesus Christ that's hitting us and always. And that's why I know he's alive in me today. Because I was dead before, but I'm alive today because of Jesus Christ. And only because his blood forgives me for all my sins and, and I'm so grateful for that Amen. thank you and, and again Pastor Matt's at it again because he has that scripture right here dead center because all my idols was Al Pacino Donald Trump it was just for money and greed but what that scripture says, but first seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, his righteousness, and all those things will be added on to you. So I want to thank you, and uh, God bless you all. But remember, please, live for Jesus Christ. Amen. There's nothing else. Live for Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Now we got we got David the Benedetto, the other Italian guy. <laughs> All right. I'm going to try to get through this without shedding too much tears. Uh, I can't promise I won't. Uh, I will choke up. Um, but bear with me as I share my testimony with you. Um, many of you may know, many of you may not know, I'm a preacher's kid. And with that, there is some... Um, uh, some particular uh, stereotype that goes with that, and I'm no exception to the rule. So um, having said that, um, I remember at a very young age uh, seeing that man, my father. Hmm. He, he walked what he taught. He preached it. And um, as so many of us, who are fathers and see our little kids looking up to us. They look at us with these eyes of, I, we can't do no wrong. And I was no exception to that as, as well. I uh, looked at my dad and I'm like, how can I ever be a man like that? He, I thought he could never sin. And um, I do make a point of it to, my, to let my kids know I'm not perfect and I can't do this without Jesus. Hmm. And, um, I'll share with you one of, one of my favorite passages in the Bible in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 9 about, if you don't already know this, this story about Mophebosheth. I just love saying the name, Mophebosheth. And um, I still to this day can't read that without hmm. just breaking down and being so grateful and so thankful that God chose me. And that no matter what I've done in my past, you know, um, he has forgiven us. And it's nothing that I deserved, nothing that I did for it, nothing that I can do for it. It's freely given, and it needs to be freely received. And so I thought of that, uh, and as I think of that story, I think of uh, uh, David, uh, after he's done, his, conquest, his conquests were over, he's, he's consolidated his, his kingdom, and he remembered, he recalled the promise he made to his Jonathan, King Saul's son, to spare and, and honor his lineage, mm -hmm. someone from his family. And he, he called his servant in and says, is there anyone from the house of Saul that I may honor them? And if you don't already know, back then, if uh, the new regime comes in, they would wipe out the old regime. They didn't want any opportunity to rise against them. And um, so many times in our life, we think that God is there with a big hammer ready to whack us. You don't know what I've done. You don't know who I've been. I'm so ashamed sometimes of what I've done and said. God's going to have to smack me. He doesn't do that. And just like David, they found uh, Mephibosheth. And as you know, the story of Mephibosheth, he, when he was young, um, and I can only imagine, he must have looked up to his dad, Jonathan, that great warrior. I want to be like dad someday. 
But as life goes on, you know, they had to flee because of the invading army, and they had to flee, and he found he was crippled on both feet. He was lame. He couldn't walk. And just like our life, we look, we, we are so optimistic, and we are so full of, um, of admiration to, to those around us, and, and then life throws its fiery darts at us, and we fall, and we're crippled with sin, and we can't walk. And um, as we know that they found Mephibosheth, and you can imagine, as they brought him in front of King David, he he knew the drill. He knew that any any kingdom before uh, any lineage left over from the kingdom before were wiped out. He must have thought, "That's it. I got my number. Here it is. I'm getting whacked." Can I say that on stage? I just I mean, I am Italian, so I got sure, a freebie sure on that did. one, right? And uh, <laughs> as he goes before David, <laughs> as he goes before David, he says. Who am I, that a dead dog like me, that you should see favor on me? And how many times do we feel like that? I'm just a dead dog. Lord, what, what could you possibly see in me? <laughs> but he, he, he sits there and says patiently, with a small, I mean, with, with a still, calming voice, I love you. I died for you. I sent my son to die for you. That I've forgiven you of your sins. It doesn't matter. I know you've been crippled with sin. Come. And just like we read in that passage at the end that Mephibosheth dined, dined continuously, continuously at the king's table. And, and for some reason, the Holy Spirit inspired the author to let him know at the end of that, that chapter that he was crippled in both feet. And um, I thought how that related to my life. And I just look at my dad. And I, I can never be that man. You don't know the life I've lived. Um, and, and by, you know, you, if we we're going to take a measuring stick out, maybe to some of you might think hey, it's nothing. But to me, it was everything because I want to serve the Lord and I thought I could do it on my own. And I always think now of that passage in, uh, in, in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Um, that Paul said, I have not obtained that which I have been obtained for. I have not, forgive me. Anyway, it's, uh, I have not obtained that which I have been obtained for. In other words, I can't even begin to imagine what God still has in store for me. I have, I have not even the slightest bit of understanding what he has for us. But this I do, forgetting those things that are behind. Amen? Amen. Forgetting those things that are behind, those, those moments when you, are, you're, you realize you're crippled and you have failed so miserably, but God says, no, it's okay. Forget those things. Keep those behind you. Look forward to those things ahead. Press towards the goal, the prize of the upward calling of God in Christ Jesus. And I'm like, Lord, thank you. Thank you for your forgiveness, for your love, your mercy, and your grace in my life. That you would see fit, just like he wrote in, uh, I believe, is in, uh, and also 2 Timothy as well. I'm sorry, 2 Timothy, that was Philippians. And then 2 Timothy, he wrote, I'm sorry, 1 Timothy, verse, chapter 3, he wrote, mm. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior, who has enabled me and counted me worthy, counted me and put me in the ministry. It's because of Jesus' grace and, and, and forgiveness in our lives that we, are, we can stand up here and talk to you. It's nothing that my talent could ever do because that's, that's corruptible. If it's a gift or a talent, if I try to rely on that, that eventually, inevitably fails. But it's God that calls. And God that calls, God enables. And um, I'm so grateful that I get to serve. Mm. I'm so grateful that um, I'm the priest of my home, first and foremost. I get to come here and, and be fed, and now I get to serve you as well. So I just thank you for your time. I thank you for listening, and uh, God bless you all, every one of you. Thank you. All right, we're gonna we're gonna transition here a bit, but before we do, I, I just I just want to say for these guys again, sometimes sometimes we ask them to do really hard things, like, hey, David, figure out how we're gonna build this building. <laughs> David's done that. Sometimes we'll say, Anthony, we need to throw a party for 400 people. You need to figure that out. We'll do that. Um, I'll ask these guys here, hey, you need to come in and teach or go pick somebody up and meet. But 
before they do all that, they're always willing to pick up a broom, pick up a mop, or go out in the parking lot and serve in the freezing weather, whether it's 90 degrees outside. And uh, that's the heart of a true servant, and, and, and we love you for that. And um, God bless you guys, man. It's just uh, very powerful stuff tonight, so thank you. All right, you're up, sir. All right, am I on? Am I good? All right. Just going to talk to you f- briefly from Acts chapter 6 about the first deacons and the importance of um, deacons in the church. You know, one author wrote that, you know, we are, as people, we have, we're, we're, we're body, soul. Some would say body, soul, and spirit. You know, it's semantics at that point. Soul and spirit kind of work together. But God has ordained two offices in the church, officers in the church, Pastors, elders, deacons. Pastors and elders are kind of interchangeable. Um, and deacons. Not that deacons can't eventually become pastors and vice versa because God can do that also. But it's interesting because this one author said that God knows what he's doing in the, to the ministry of people. Deacons really minister to the body, to the body. And pastors, they feed the flock. They minister to the soul. And again, as you read through the book of Acts, you see that sometimes it's, it's both. It's interchangeable. You see pastors doing the work of deacons. You sometimes see deacons doing the work of pa- pastors when you get to Acts chapter 7. But it's important in the body of Christ. In Acts chapter 6, the early church was growing. People were getting saved from different backgrounds. Uh, there were the Jewish widows that were involved in the church who, again, their husbands had long since passed on and they were needed the help of the early church and the finances of the early church to, to survive, to, to get food delegated and given out to them. And what, what was happening was there were other women getting saved and the scriptures called them the Grecian widows. And one of the two, the Grecians thought that they were being overlooked in the daily ministration. What, the, what that meant was as the church was growing, the Grecians felt like the Hebrew women were being favored. And they probably thought that because all the apostles were Jewish. A lot of the early church in the book of Acts that God saved was Jewish. But people were getting saved from all different kinds of backgrounds. And uh, these Grecian widows felt like they were being overlooked. So the apostles were caught up in teaching the word of God. Public and in private. Rightly dividing the word of truth, teaching the word of God. And they started to do all this other stuff. Well, how can we make lists and, and have, you know, layouts on how we can feed everybody and, and, you know, make collections to help people out and, and, and feed the poor and feed the Grecian widows and the Hebrew widows. And, you know, how do we make sure that people aren't taking advantage of the finances of the church, that they really are widows? Who's going to do that background check? How are we going to? So the apostles were trying to figure out how to do all this while studying the word and teaching the word. And they were just getting overwhelmed. They were getting overwhelmed. So with the wisdom of God and a lot of prayer, God gave them an answer. And that's kind of really where you pick it up in Acts chapter 6. It says, And in those days when the number of the disciples were multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians and the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. So it doesn't say it was a possibility that they were neglected. It doesn't say some of them thought they were neglected. They were really neglected. I don't think it was on purpose, but it doesn't matter if it was on purpose or not. They were still neglected. And they were trying to work this out. They were trying to understand why. So the 12, the apostles, the the, the ones who were teaching the word of God, publicly and private, the 12 called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, it's not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. He said, the one thing we cannot do, now obviously they were getting caught up in doing that. They were getting caught up in doing everything else. They were getting caught up in making lists, daily administration, how are we going to make sure these people are fed, where's the offering going to go, who's going to help with this, who's going to organize the kids, who's going to oversee this. They were getting caught up in everything else because there are a lot of needs and a lot of ministries in a local church. There's a lot. Sometimes people think that, you know, hey, you know what? 
I want to get into ministry. I want to be a pastor. Think about it. You get up there once a week, maybe twice if you're real spiritual. You do it Wednesday, all right? And you got the rest of the week off. You're golfing, you know, whatever you want to do all week long. That's what people think. Then they get a little closer. This is what I hear from people all the time. Whoa, there's a lot more going on than they ever thought was going on. There was a lot going on in that early church. There's a lot that goes on in churches. When you deal with people, some people are up, some people are down. Some people, they have the way the Lord's working in their life, they're able to be discipled a lot quicker, become good functioning members of society and the kingdom, and it's like low maintenance. But some people, it's harder, it's difficult. But that's how God chose to do things. We're all his people. If you love Jesus, some people need a little bit more help, a little more guidance because they had a lot more hurt or pain or whatever it is. I don't know how to figure all that out. But when you deal with people, there's a lot of work involved. And there's a lot of ministry that needs to be done for the poor, for the sick, for the hurting, for the dying, and more than any of that, for the salvation of souls. And this is what it says. The 12, they got the multitude together and they said, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God. Because listen, if you leave the word of God, you don't have church anymore. You don't have the ecclesia. What's the ecclesia? Ecclesia is the Greek word for church. It means the called out people of God that come together to meet, to worship God. And the primary way we worship God, yes, at the forefront of that is how does God show us that he's to be worshipped? We have his word. That's how. Listen, by the way, let me give you some parallels here. If you read through the Old Testament, listen, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God never changes. You know, when you read the book of Genesis, the theme of the book of Genesis is election. God chooses to create, and then he chooses a people. He, cho he chooses Abraham, then he chooses Joseph. I mean, it's, it's all through there. Then you get to Exodus. The theme of the book of Exodus, I'm going somewhere with this. The theme of the book of Exodus is redemption. Now God grows those people and he goes, those are my people, I'm going to buy them back. Put the blood on the doorpost, they were enslaved, I'm going to buy them back. Just like Jesus did for us. He chose us, he loved us, he set us apart, he bought us with his own blood. But what? You know what the theme of the next book is? Leviticus. Okay, this God who chose us, loves us, set his heart upon us, redeemed us. You know what the book of Leviticus is, the theme? It's worship. How's this God to be worshipped? And God gives them a whole litany of things they need to do to relate to this holy God. And you cannot leave the word of God. If you leave the word of God, you won't know what God expects of, of us, how to worship him, what he's all about. And he says, we cannot leave the word of God. They were obviously starting to do that. So they asked for wisdom. They said, we can't just serve tables. He didn't say, we can't leave the word of God and only stick with the word of God. He didn't say, they didn't say, the early apostles didn't say that, hey, we should not serve tables anymore. They didn't say that. They didn't do that. So again, the body of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ, it, it's not just about, again, preaching for 45 minutes and everybody just goes home. No, there's a lot of ministry that goes on. All of you do it all week long. These men do it. We all do it. In whatever way we can do it. When we come together and when we go out. But you can't leave the word of God. And you can't only serve the body, the needs of people. You got to do both. You got to do both. You have to serve the needs of people. But you're not serving any of the needs of people if you leave the word of God, if you're not telling them about Jesus Christ. Now watch. Look at this wisdom. They say, wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men. They said, well, seven's a good number. Seven's a number of completion. Maybe that's why they came up with it. All right? Find seven men. Look what it says. Wherefore, brethren, look out among you. They didn't go out there. They didn't go with the wisdom of the world. 
They said, seven men from among you. Among you. That's why the, the men that are up here today that are getting ordained as deacons, again, one of them said, a deacon just means to serve at a deeper level. That's what it means. They're from among you. It wasn't just two days ago or two weeks ago they came to church and we said, hey, these guys got it together. Let's just put them up there and ordain them. No? I got nervous because Eddie said recently. When he says recently, he doesn't mean like a month ago if you knew here. He's been serving around here for a long, long, long time. A long, long, long time. Now listen. It's from among you. That means the people in the church recognize that, yeah, these men are called to serve. We've seen it. It means the leadership in the church has seen that, yeah, these men are called to serve and hold the office of a deacon. We've seen it. And God, more than any of that, has consecrated that, and that's just the fulfillment of what God is doing today. But you've seen it. The leadership has seen it. And God's saying, yep, I want to recognize that. I want to recognize that. Yeah, to, to hold the, an office in the church, yes, it's a place of honor. Yes, it's a place of consecration. Yes, it's a place that you're set apart. But it's also a place, like Pastor Jin said, that you're willing to grow a little bit more. You're willing to serve a little bit more. You're willing to suffer a little bit more. That's why it's a place of honor in God's eyes. Not because it's a title and you get to have a position and a certificate and all those things. Yeah, well, in God's eyes, it's honorable because you get to serve a little bit more like his son Jesus did. Look what it says. What, what were the qualifications of these men? Again, you can compare 1 Timothy 3. We don't have time to go there. But it says this. They had to be men of honest report. Honest report. So how do you know if men are of honest report? They got to be around. They got to be faithful. You got to see them. You got to know their lives. You got to go know their work ethic. You got to know what they're all about. They have to be part of the body of Christ. People need to recognize that and see that men that are of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost. How do you know if men are full of the Holy Ghost? Because they speak in tongues? Maybe. That's an evidence. You know how? Because they have the fruit of the Spirit in their life. Doesn't mean that they have it all the time. They're filled with love, joy, peace, gentleness, or, you know, meekness, all that. No, all the time. No, but you can see it in their lives for an extended period of time. And no, listen, you know how you can recognize it also? You can see that they're obedient. They're obedient to the Word of God. They're obedient to what the leadership in the church is trying to do in the church. They're, they're men that come alongside, that help out. They're not strifers. They're not dividers. They're unifiers. Well, why were these men called out from among the people? Because there, were, there was division going on in the church. And the disciple says, hey, we can't handle all this division. We're doing the best we can to teach the Word of God and preach it and minister it in public and in private. So what's next? You know what? There's division going on. We need some men that can unify this. The unifiers. They're not men that are going to sit there and say, hey, when do I get my preaching time? When do I get my title? When do I get this? When do I have that? When do I? No, that's not the mind of Christ. That's not the heart of Christ. They're men that say, hey, I'll do whatever it takes to minister to God's people because Jesus ministers to me. Full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, decision-making. They make wise choices in the practical matters of life and in church life. Why? They're not tossed about by every wind of doctrine. Hey, over here. Hey, did you see this? Hey, did you see that? You know, the body of Christ is doing that all the time. I talk to my wife about this all the time. I get this message, this email, this text. Hey, what's going on? And then you don't see the person around church for a long time because they saw this thing and they're, they're scared. So they're on this wind of doctrine and they're looking out and they're watching the new. They're all over the place. They're just not solid, steadfast, and faithful. That's what you need to see in people called out to ministry. Solid, steadfast, and faithful. Whether it's up, whether it's down, whether there's a pandemic, whether a nuclear bomb goes off somewhere, heaven forbid, Solid, steadfast, 
faithful. Make wise choices. So the, the apostles say, hey, we're serving tables too much. We can't do this only. We need some help. But we need some godly men to come alongside. What do these men look like? Honest, full of the Holy Ghost, wisdom, who they can appoint over this business because it's serious business. It's serious business. Listen, serving Jesus Christ in any capacity, let alone in an ordained capacity, an ordained capacity is serious business. Seriously. So some of you know me. I'm a, I'm a clown. I'm a joker. I joke around all, a lot. Some people don't get it. They're like, that guy's the pastor? You know, what's he passing out over there? Drugs? I mean, what's going on? <laughs> you know? But when it comes to the Word of God, I'm serious. I believe it all. It's God's Word. Inspired. I believe in it, and in Jesus Christ, we have everything we need for faith and for practice on how, we to li- how we're to live in this life, how we're to train the next generation, how we're to do church, how we're to minister to a lost and dying world. It tells us everything that we need to know. When it comes about th- to this book, I'm, I'm, I'm serious. Men, full of the Holy Ghost, wisdom, so we can appoint them over this business. But then verse 4 says, but we have to give ourselves continually to prayer in the ministry of the word. So the saying pleased the whole multitude. It wasn't just the leadership and the deacons they chose. Everyone said, yeah, this is a great idea. Let's get these men some help so they can help each other in the ministry. This is a great idea. It says, we will give ourselves continually to prayer verse for our ministry of the word. And the same pleased the whole church, that whole body. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. Philip, Philip of Prochorus, Nicana, Timon, Parmenius, Nicholas, the pros- a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. Listen, they set them before them. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. It's a symbol of consecration. And it's a symbol of any power that God has given me. God, let it rest on them also and more. It's a symbol of being set apart. It means something. It says they brought them before the apostles. They laid their hands on them. Now look at the results of the wisdom. Look at the results of what God was going to do with these men. It says in verse 7, in the word of God increased. The word of God increased. And the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Then it talks about Stephen, one of the first deacons. Read it, because he's, he's a preacher also. Now listen. Do you see the results of making wise choices on whom, um, of whom is going to serve the body of Christ? You see the results? It says the word of God increased. The number of disciples multiplied greatly. Listen to me. Hear me. That's what we want to happen here. We want the word of God to in- increase. We want the word of God to increase. We want people to come to know Jesus through the word of God. We want people to be disciples of Jesus because they're learning the word of God. Because they're being taught not just to learn it and know it up here, but to live it also. Like Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Listen, but you know, there's a problem. And the problem in the churches is the same problem that's been around since the time of Christ. You know what the problem is? Jesus said this. To his disciples. He said, you look out to the harvest. Look at what he said. He said, look to the harvest. Now he was looking over a grain field. Yes, I get all that. But he was using the, the, the field of grain and all the stalks to say, look to the harvest. The harvest is plentiful. It's ripe. It's ready to be harvested. But the laborers are few. That's the problem. The problem is, listen, the harvest is plentiful. 750,000 people on the North Shore, less than 2% really believe this book. I say it all the time. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. That's a problem. 
People want to get into the ministry because they don't think they need to labor anymore once they're in the ministry. People want to get into ministry because I've done all my credentials in that particular denomination and now this is my next step. When do I get my job? People want to get into the ministry for all kinds of motivations and reasons. But there's still a problem. The problem is most of them don't want to labor. They want to labor. The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And I say this from what I see in these men. They're willing to labor. Labor. And yeah, sometimes that means climb up on the building. It does. They do. Sometimes it means help us mop the floor over here. There's floods every time it rains. Because, because Pastor Matt put the building together. I really know what I was doing for some of it. And uh, we had people try to help rectify some of that. It got better. But they're mopping up stuff. We got to labor. For, for the body of Christ. That means labor and talking about Jesus, labor and picking up trash for Jesus, labor and doing whatever we need to do for Jesus. The harvest is plentiful still. It's still plentiful if you haven't seen. But the laborers are few. But there's a solution. Pray. Pray that the Lord of the harvest would send what? More money? No. No. Pray that the Lord of the harvest would send more money, more giftedness. No. Pray that he'd send more laborers into the harvest field. And that's what we're doing here today. That's why it's important. I need you to pray for these men. I need you to pray for the leaders here. Pray for the pastors. Pray for the deacons. Pray for one another in the body of Christ. We, we couldn't do this without you. I mean that. Let's pray right now. Just as we bow our heads together, um, just nobody looking around, heads bowed and eyes closed. Um, Father, we come before you right now, Lord, and I just thank you for what you're doing here today. And I know all the congregation recognizes these men as laborers already, Lord. And I know this is, you just putting your stamp of approval on it, Lord. So, Lord, just, just have your way, Lord. And just bless them, Lord. Let them do more, Lord, in your power and your grace to serve this body, these people, and the people around us, Lord. Thank you for what you consecrate, Lord. Lord, if there's anybody that has heard this message for the first time about Jesus Christ and they're wondering if this Bible stuff is true, Lord, even through a message like this that is directed toward leaders, Lord, I know you, you'll reach down, you'll, you'll change their heart, you'll save their soul, Lord. So if there's anybody here that doesn't know you or that's watching at home, I pray that right now they would cry out to you. In the quiet of the hour, they would just say, I'm a sinner, I believe in you, Jesus, that you took all my sin away on a cross. You died for me and you rose again. Please be my Savior and give me eternal life. Does anybody here that needs to do that, Lord, I pray that they do that right now in the quiet of the hour that they would call on your name and be saved, Lord. Because this is why we labor, Lord. Lord, have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm just going to have the other, um, the other ordained offices in the church just come up at this time. And uh, we're going to lay hands. Again, it's a sign of consecration. You want to just have them to just come up here, take one knee. You guys can just come up front. Don't fall off the stage. <laughs> and if the other ordained officers can just lay, just lay hands on the guys, make sure we're all connected here. You come over here, one on each guy. And then I'm just going to pray a prayer of consecration as we just set these men apart. Father, we come in Jesus' name. Lord, and um, we're just thank, thankful right now, Lord, that you're, you're just calling out more laborers in your harvest field, Lord. Lord, men of a good report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, Lord. And Lord, I know when we hear that as leaders, Lord, we're convicted because there's still so much more you need to do in all of our lives here up on the stage, Lord. And Lord, would you do it, Lord? And I just pray for them right now, Lord, as we lay hands, Lord. 
that anything that's in us that you can impart to them, that you would do that, Lord, that you, you would use all their special gifts and talents, Lord, you'd increase them so they can minister more to your body, to your flock, blood-bought whom you died for, Jesus. Lord, we just thank you so much that you do all things well, Lord. And you get all the glory for all their lives and everything you've done, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Let's give Jesus the glory. Thank you, guys.